met a girl lost in a book, dream and the past. Follow, she said, and jumped in a page. She smiled as she asked. Walked to Glenfern and we headed with Charlie. We drank an old leaf. We were toasted by a rabbi. We stood as they signed and I brought at the abbey. She took me to places that I never thought you could see. Hi, and welcome to another episode by Random Scottish History for Independence Live. We're going to discuss witchcraft in Scotland and how that went down for the people of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, I'm wearing a cloak that I made to be Raven from the Teen Titans a few years back. Being the most witchy costume item I think I own, uh, at least that I could find. Um, There's a lot to get into here. Uh, Francis Legg wrote into the Scottish Review an article entitled Witchcraft in Scotland. That was for October of 1891, and he really lays the ground and the basis for what we're going to discuss here. The Most of the information will come from his article, though we'll divert into other publications as they can fill out some of the details a wee bit more that he gives us. So we'll get into it. From the Scottish Review, Francis Legg's Witchcraft in Scotland, October 1891, he tells us, In the history of Scottish witchcraft, there is nothing to excite the wonder which in some measure deadens the disgust with which we contemplate the deeds of a Philip the Fair or a Gaelis de Retz. Here the victims are, with hardly an exception, such poor and wretched old women as are still to be found by scores in every parish in town or country while the persecutors are the pious, zealous and, on the whole, learned clergy, whom we have been accustomed to reverence as the very patterns and exemplars of the milder virtues of Christianity. We are apt, while rightly condemning the cruelty and superstition of certain foreign ecclesiastics, to forget that there existed, at no very distant date, a tribunal in our own land, which, in both cruelty and superstition, actually exceeded the worst of foreign inquisitions. We know that the persecution of witches raged unchecked in the continent long before the coming of the German reformers, and that even after that date the witch-hunters of Catholic Germany, Spain and Italy sought after their prey with a zeal as fiery, though hardly as searching as that of their Protestant contemporaries. All that is certain is that the fury spread from one country to another, disregarding the barriers of language, creed and race, until, about a century after it had shown itself in Central Europe, it reached the distant shores of Scotland. Here it continued for about the same length of time as in the place of its birth, to gradually expire in the same manner, and apparently from the same cause, that had there brought about its decline. The beginning of which persecution in Scotland is generally supposed to coincide with the passing of the Act of 1563, but this can hardly be accepted without some qualification. The civil law was always terribly severe against witchcraft, and in the proclamation of 1510 for regulating the proceedings at circuit courts, the judges were directed to inquire if there be any witchcraft or sorcery used in the realm. We even hear of some fourteen or fifteen witches being burned to Edinburgh in 1479 for compassing the death of James III by the familiar means of a wax image, and a similar tale is told with regard to the rather mythical King Duffus, about 961 CE-ish. It is probable, however, that unless the offence were coupled with some graver crime such as treason, the judges were satisfied with banishing the offender, and this is the punishment inflicted upon one Agnes Mullikin, who was arraigned before the High Court of Justiciary just before the Act came into operation. Why the legislature thought it necessary to increase the severity of the punishment is not very clear, and the words of the statute itself seem to point rather to an enlightened scepticism on the part of its authors than to any vehement belief in the extensive use of diabolic agency. 
after reciting that the Queen's Majesty and the three estates in this present Parliament are informed of the heavy and abominable superstition used by diverse of the lieges of this realm by using of witchcraft, sorcery, and necromancy, and credence given thereto in times bygone against the laws of God, it goes on to enact that, for avoiding of all such vain superstition in times to come, no person shall use any manner of witchcraft, sorcery, or necromancy, nor give themselves forth to have any such craft or knowledge thereof, there through abusing the people, and then prescribes the penalty of death, as well as against such user or abuser as the seeker of the response or consultation. It is curious that all subsequent witch trials in Scotland should have been founded on an enactment which seems to have been aimed at nothing more than the fraudulent assumption of supernatural power. During the first year of its operation, four women were denounced by the superintendent of Fife. Their cases were reported to the General Assembly, who contented themselves with petitioning the Privy Council to take order concerning them, but it does not appear that any notice was taken of the petition. Nor is it probable that during the remainder of the disturbed reign of Mary the ministers found themselves strong enough to insist upon the law being enforced. Under Murray, things were different, and during the last year of his regency we hear that he caused to burn certain witches at St Andrews on his way to the north, and another company of witches at Dundee on his return. Among the St Andrews executions were those of a notable sorceress called Nick Nevin, possibly the mother Nick Nevin of Sir Walter Scott, and the Lion King at Arms. The latter was the most distinguished personage that suffered during the hundred years that the witch persecution lasted, but as he had originally been arrested for a conspiracy against Murray's life, it is probable that in this, as in most the earlier cases, the accusation of witchcraft was but a convenient way of getting rid of a political enemy. The assassination of the regent in 1570 again threw the administration of the criminal law into confusion until the accession to power of Morton, whose dislike of the more zealous of the ministers made it little likely that he would do anything to yield to their wishes. In spite, therefore, of the declaration by the General Assembly in 1575 that the Kirk hath no power to cognose or discern upon witchcraft, there was little vigour displayed in the enforcement of the Act, and although two or three cases came before the High Court at Edinburgh and the Circuit Courts, the General Assembly in 1583 were able to complain to the King that there is no punishment for, among other crimes, witchcraft in such sort that daily sin increaseth and provoketh the wrath of God against the whole country. Five years afterwards, a witch who had before been accused but had been allowed to escape by the Archbishop of St Andrews was convicted by the exertions of the General Assembly, while a process in 1590 against Lady Fowlis, who seems to have really attempted both by witchcraft and poisoning to take off several members of her own family, only resulted in the acquittal of the principals in the crime and in the execution of some of the subaltern accomplices. At the same time as Lady Fowlis was under suspicion for witchcraft and poisoning her relatives, James VI was headed over to Denmark to meet his wife, Anne, and on his return suffered inconveniences which were to have strong aftermath for the witches in Scotland. So Chambers, in his Edinburgh Journal, an article entitled Sketches of Superstitions from July 18th, 1840, elaborates on this circumstance a wee bit. In 1590, James, it is well known, made a voyage to Denmark to see, marry, and conduct home in person his appointed bride, the Princess Anne. Soon after his arrival, a tremendous witch conspiracy against the happy conclusion of his homeward voyage was discovered, in which the principal agents appeared to be persons considerably above the vulgar. One was Mrs. Agnes Sampson, commonly called the wise wife of Keith, Keith being a village in East Lothian, who is described as grave, matron-like, and settled in her answers. On this occasion, the king was induced by his peculiar tastes to engage personally in the business of judicial investigation. 
He had all the accused persons brought before himself for examination and even superintended the tortures applied to them to induce their confession. The statements made by these poor wretches form a singular tissue of the ludicrous and horrible in intimate union. The said Agnes Sampson was after brought again before the King's Majesty and his council, and being examined of the meetings and detestable dealings of those witches, she confessed that upon the night of all hallow even she was accompanied, as well with the persons aforesaid, as also with a great many other witches, to the number of two hundred, and that all they together went to see, each one in a riddle or sieve, and went in the same very substantially with flagons of wine, making merry and drinking by the way in the same riddles or sieves to the kirk of North Berwick in Lothian, and that after they had landed, took hands on the land and danced this real or short dance, singing all with one voice, Come or go ye before, come or go ye, gif you not go before, come or let me, at which she confessed that Gilis Duncan did go before them, playing this reel or dance upon a small trump called the Jew's harp, until they entered into the Kirk of North Berwick. These made the king in a wonderful admiration, and he sent for the said Gilis Duncan, who upon the like trump did play the said dance before the king's majesty, who, in respect of the strangeness of these matters, took great delight to be present at their examinations. In the sequel of Agnes Sampson's confession, we find some special reasons for the king's passionate liking for these exhibitions, in addition to the mere love of the marvellous. The witches pandered to his vanity on all occasions, probably in the vain hope of mitigating their own doom. Agnes Sampson declared that one great object with Satan and his agents was to destroy the king, that they had held the great North Berwick Convention for no other end, and that they had endeavoured to effect their aim on many occasions, and particularly by raising a storm at sea when James came across from Denmark. The witches demanded of the devil why he did bear such hatred to the king, who answered, By reason the king is the greatest enemy he hath in the world. Such a eulogy from such a quarter could not but pamper the conceit of the Scottish Solomon. Of course, in the revelations of the various witches, inconsistencies were abundant, and even plain and evident impossibilities were frequently among the things averred. The sapient James, however, in place of being led by these things to doubt the whole, was only strengthened in his opinions, it being a maxim of his that the witches were all extreme liars. Other persons came to different conclusions from the same premises, and before the close of James's reign, many men of sense began to weary of the torturings and incremations that took place almost every day, in town or country, and had done so for a period of thirty years, betwixt 1519 and 1620. Advocates now came forward to defend the accused, and in their pleadings ventured even to arraign some of the received axioms of demonology laid down by the king himself in a book bearing that name. The removal of James to England moderated, but did not altogether stop the witch prosecutions. After his death, they slackened most considerably. Only eight witchcraft cases are on the record as having occurred between 1625 and 1640 in Scotland, and in one of these cases, remarkable to tell, the accused escaped. We'll go back to Francis Legg's article from the Scottish Review. He continues by telling us that up to this period the ditties against the alleged witches are filled with recitals of such simple sorceries as the medicinal use of herbs and the performance of trivial and meaningless ceremonies. In no case is the efficacy of the cures or enchantments attributed to any more dreaded agency than that of the good folk or fairies. But now a change comes over the form of the indictments, which shows that the managers of these trials had not allowed some of the more extraordinary theories of the continental witch-hunters to escape them. Within a month after Lady Fowlis's acquittal, Janet Grant or Gradach and Janet Clark or Spaulding were put to the bar of the High Court, charged with bewitching to death 
several persons, with killing cattle, with preventing the consummation of marriages, and with raising the devil. They were both found guilty, strangled, and burnt, but the evidence at their trial prepared the people, as it was perhaps intended to do, for the tragedy that was to follow. In May of the same year, James, when returning from Denmark with his bride, had met with the contrary winds which had put him in some danger. It was now given out that this untoward weather was caused by a number of witches who had assembled in conventions at North Berwick Church and at other places, and had attempted in conjunction with Satan, present among them in bodily form, to hinder the king's return to his native land. A number of persons, among whom John Fien, or Cunningham, a schoolmaster in Trenent, was assigned the leading part, were arrested and examined before the king in person. After the most fearful and unheard-of tortures had been inflicted upon the accused, confessions were obtained from them, in which all the wild and impossible features of the Sabbath, as described by Del Rio and De Lancre, the form of adoration of the devil, his amours with the witches and the charms made from the bodies of the dead, were set out with all details. At first, James, who was shrewd enough in such matters, listened without being much impressed, and declared the witches to be extreme liars. But when the name of Bothwell was introduced as the contriver of the attempt on his life, his attitude changed. For Bothwell, who had jointly with Lennox governed the realm with great firmness and judgment during the king's absence, James had a nervous horror, which was artfully stimulated by the Chancellor, Maitland of Thirlstane. Bothwell was thrown into prison from which he managed to escape, upon the peers who had been summoned for the trial refusing to meet, knowing, as says the chronicler, that the king had no just occasion of grief nor crime to allege against him, but only at the instigation of the Chancellor. Three years later, having forced his way into James's presence, he demanded a trial, which resulted in his acquittal, but was proclaimed a rebel soon afterwards and died in exile. In the meantime, his supposed accomplices had been brought to trial and executed, the only person of note among them being Euphemia Macallion, the daughter of Lord Clifton Hall, a senator of the College of Justice, from sixty to two hundred persons were denounced. We are perhaps justified in assuming that at least fifty of these were convicted. Now we have an article from the Scots magazine that gives us a wee bit about witches now becoming satanic emissaries. This is from, again, the Scots magazine, entitled Scottish Antiquities. It's part three on the popular superstitions of ghosts and witches incident to the border, dated the 1st of May, 1816. It reads, Witches, again, were a common and, of course, a more troublesome community. These emissaries of Satan have long held the minds of the border peasantry in uncontrolled sway. The glorious dawn of Reformation swept away numerous hosts of these formidable superstitions, but the more hellish one of sorcery or witchcraft remained unscathed amid the general conflagration. Everything in nature was deemed subject to its unlimited control. The air, on the earth, and in the waters, witches exercised their dominion and gave laws to the whirlwinds and the storm. They could bridle the fury of the torrent to arrest the planets in their course. Nay, such was the potency of their infernal charms that the dead arose at their call and the spirits returned their awful summons from beyond the barriers of that unknown land to answer their demands and give evidence in matters of their diabolical concerns. This direful idea was laid hold on to convict numbers of poor, infirm wretches who were suspected of holding communion with the father of superstitions, merely because they were unfortunate, unfriended, and abandoned in the world. Old men and women were hurried to the ordeal of fire and water, or bound to the stake and murdered on their own confessions. Even trifles light as air were held as confirmation strong, and blood alone could expiate the crime of dealing with the foul thief, or holding their nocturnal revels by the light of the moon in order to destroy their neighbours' goods and chattels. 
to such a height was this persecuting spirit carried in the beginning of the 18th and latter part of the 17th century that every suspected person was obliged to undergo the strictest scrutiny, and if any insensible mark, such as a mole, a strawberry, etc., was found, they were immediately convicted of fostering a succubus or imp of hell and giving it suck at one of these marks, to which they gave the name of an infernal teat. Back to Francis Legg in his Scottish Review article, he continues by telling us the panic fear of witchcraft, which seems to be the proximate cause of all witch persecutions, was fairly aroused, and neither king nor clergy had any idea of letting it die out. In 1592, the Privy Council ordered that blank commissions giving power to imprison for witchcraft should be issued to the General Assembly to be filled up as they should think fit, a compliment which the Presbytery of Glasgow tried to return the following year by petitioning the Assembly to print and publish all the particulars of the impiety of the witches and their late conspiracy, in order, as they said, that the same may be divulged and made notor to the whole inhabitants in this country. The length to which these measures led may be judged by what happened in Aberdeen in 1596. In that year, there seems to have been an epidemic disease in the city, which, from the symptoms described, was a malarial fever. Of this, many of the poorer inhabitants died, and their neighbours, stirred up by the reports from Edinburgh, insisted that it was the work of one family of singular habits, who had for a long time been suspected of witchcraft. A commission from the Privy Council was therefore applied for, and before April 1597, 23 women and one man had been burnt. One woman had died under torture, one had hanged herself in prison, and four others who were acquitted on the capital charge were yet branded on the cheek and banished from the sheriffdom. As usual, the persons executed had in their extorted confessions accused others, and many of these had taken alarm in time and had fled the country. One Margaret Atkin, who had been arrested in Fife, was led by the fear of torture to make a confession involving many hundreds of people. In this she alleged that she could recognise a witch by a certain mark in the eyes. She was, in consequence, carried about by the ministers in charge of her case from one town to another, that she might be confronted with anyone suspected, and thus Many innocent persons were put to death. At last, her imposture was detected by the fact that she sometimes failed to recognise those whom she had formerly denounced. And she was burnt, confessing with her last breath that the whole of her pretended revelations were false. Bowes, the English ambassador, writes to Lord Burley in August 1597 that the witches swarm in thousands and, as Margaret Atkin gave an account of one Sabbath, where she asserted 2,300 persons were present, it is evident that the executions might soon have reached that figure. But the king, who seems to have now become alarmed at the height to which the delusion had grown, revoked at one stroke all the commissions of justiciary then in existence, and thus for a time put a stop to the terror. This merciful act, came too late to save the life of poor Alison Balfour, whose trial shows more human suffering than perhaps has ever before been crowded into a single room, nor was it able altogether to tame the zeal of the Aberdeen ministers, for we find a resolution by the Presbytery in 1602 that there shall be a privy inquest for witches through the whole parish, the results of which were to be sent to the Marquis of Huntley as sheriff of the county, in order that the land may be purged of such instruments of the devil. All the evidence on the subject goes to show that no more victims were sacrificed as the result of these inquiries. From 1600 to 1620, there were frequent convictions for witchcraft, both before the High Court and the Commission still granted for the trial of individual cases. The infection spread even to Orkney and Shetland, where the law thing executed during this period at least 25 persons. Nor do the ministers appear to have in any way abandoned their claim to assist the lay courts in the exercise of their jurisdiction. Thus, in the case of Grizzle Gardner, who was arraigned before the High Court in 
in 1610. The principal witness against the panel was Mr. John Caldcleugh, minister, who deposed that the presbytery had directed him as their moderator to notify the truth of the accusation to the Privy Council that some order might be taken anent her trial and punishment. In 1624, the Council proclaimed that, to the intent that neither should the innocent be molested nor the guilty escape, all informations should thenceforth pass through the hands of the Bishop of the Diocese to be seen and considered by him and such of the ministry as he should call unto him. This was clearly to the advantage of the accused, because the bishop was, from his position, not likely to be under the fear of reprisals which led the neighbours of a delated person to look with horror upon the possibility of a witch's escape. Its effect was seen in a marked falling off in the number of executions from this date, down to the death of James, and in the denunciation to the council in 1632 of one John Balfour, who is alleged to have made a regular trade of discovering witches and to have gone about the country abusing simple and ignorant people for his private gain in commodity. The civil commotions which followed upon Charles's attempt to force a liturgy upon the Scottish people and the signing of the Covenant in 1638 probably kept the ministers too busy for a few years to attend to the concoction of witch processes, but as soon as their hands were free, the persecution broke out with redoubled fury. The General Assembly in 1640 called upon the Parliament and the judges to enforce unsparingly the laws against witchcraft, and from 1640 until the evasion of Cromwell there was no one to place any check upon their activity. I believe that the details of this second persecution, could they be brought to light, would be found to be more shocking than the deeds of Sprenger and Instator, creators of the Malleus Maleficarum, and that the witch hunters found their way into the most remote corners of the land. Even the very summary procedure of the law proved too cumbrous for the speed of their operations. The Presbytery of St Andrews in 1644 found themselves compelled to procure from the Earl of Lindsay a general commission for apprehending, trying and judging such as are or shall be delated for witches within the stewartry, and in the same year the Presbytery of Lanark deemed it necessary to provide that each parish should provide guards for its own witches. Such a strain was put upon the resources of the smaller parishes by the fees attending the commissions for the trial of the persons they had apprehended that the Provincial Assembly of Lothian in Tweeddale in 1649 requested my Lord Lothian to speak to the Committee of Estates that their lordships may give order to their clerks to issue out commissions for the trial and burning of witches gratis. In the same year, the estates passed at the instance of the General Assembly an act extending the provisions of the Act of 1563 and making it more clear that those who merely consulted witches were to be punished with death. The effect of these measures may be guessed from a statement in Whitelock's memorials that on the 15th of April 1650, at a little village within two miles of Berwick, Two men and three women were burnt for witches, and nine more were to be burnt, the village consisting of but fourteen families, and there were as many witches, and that twenty more were to be burnt within six miles of that place. When Cromwell made his attempt to unite England and Scotland under one system of law, his commissioner for the administration of justice found in their first circuit upwards of sixty prisoners awaiting trial for witchcraft. Most of these poor creatures had confessed, but on hearing how their confessions had been obtained, the commissioners directed that they should all be released. This proved to be the beginning of a more enlightened policy towards those accused of the crime, and during the continuance of Cromwell's supremacy, but very few were burnt. There is much witchery up and down our land, writes Robert Bailey regretfully. The English be but too sparing to try it, but some they execute. It is with difficulty that the record of any executions can be found until the last two years of the English domination, when the impediments with which Cromwell had surrounded the execution upon witches of what was then facetiously called justice were in part removed. From 1658 to 1660, the trials began again, and 38 women and two men were executed in Edinburgh and the neighbouring counties. This, however, 
was but a mild prelude to the storm of persecution which broke out at the Restoration. Whatever satisfaction the return of King Charles II might afford to the younger females in his dominions, says the witty editor of Law's Memorials, it certainly brought nothing save torture and destruction to the unfortunate old women or witches of Scotland. For three years, indeed, the Privy Council seems to have had little else to do but to issue commissions for their trial and execution. Within twelve months from August 1661, commissions were issued for the trial of 166 persons, without taking into account some 20 or 30 more who were indicted before the High Court. The numbers indeed lead us to expect a return to the barbarities of the time of James VI, but this was far from being the case. On the contrary, there are many signs that the council were glad of any excuse for mitigating the cruelty with which suspected witches had formerly been treated. In February 1662, James Welsh was whipped through Edinburgh and put in the House of Correction for a year for falsely accusing several persons. Three months later, John Kincaid, the pricker or witch-finder of Trinent, whose fame in Scotland had at one time emulated that of his English analogue Matthew Hopkins, was imprisoned by the council for presuming to prick and try witches on his own responsibility, and was only released on giving bail for his amendment, and during the same month a proclamation was issued prohibiting anyone from apprehending persons suspect of witchcraft without authority from the council, the sheriffs or counties, or their deputies, a rule which was thereafter adhered to with tolerable strictness. But that which most clearly shows the humaner intentions of the council is the clause henceforth appearing in their commissions to the effect that no confessions shall be used to extract confessions, and that the sanity of all confessants shall be inquired into before sentence. This last step seems to have been taken in consequence of the complaints against Mr. James Gillespie, the Minister of Rind, who was charged before the council with having obtained false confessions by means of tortures, pricking, and keeping several women from sleep, on which confessions the innocent had suffered death. After 1662, no judicial torture was used, although it is to be feared that the clergy continued the pricking and waking when they thought they could do so with impunity. From this period, the persecution began to decline. The fear of witchcraft, if one may borrow the language of modern medicine, had become sporadic rather than epidemic. Now and again, some minister with more zeal or less discretion than his fellows would busy himself with obtaining informations against a notor witch. Then a commission would be applied for and the witch tormented either physically or morally until she had denounced others. A few executions would follow and the popular excitement would die out to reappear in some other spot. And everywhere throughout Europe, the fires of persecution were burning low. The Cossio Criminalis of the Jesuit Spee, published in 1631, so thoroughly exposed the absurdities and cruelties of the witch trials that the Archbishop, Elector of Mainz, and many other German princes abolished them in their dominions. The Elector of Brandenburg in 1654 ordered that everyone accused of the crime should be allowed to defend himself before instead of after the torture. And in 1670, Louis the Fourteenth insisted, in spite of the protests of the Parliament of Normandy, upon commuting to banishment the sentence of death which the Parliament had passed upon a batch of witches. The electoral chambers of Germany followed this good example with the best results, and after this last date, the executions for witchcraft upon the continent may almost be counted on the fingers of two hands. As Scotland was the last country in Europe to which the infection of terror came, so was it the last from which it departed. Sir George Mackenzie, writing in 1678, strongly asserts his belief in the existence of witchcraft, although he pleads for the better treatment of the accused. In 1680, the release of several suspects upon a report from Sir George Mackenzie to the Lords of Session that their confessions were not only absurd but had been obtained by torture seemed to have brought about the end of the persecution. For sixteen years there were no more executions, and in 1684, a miserable old woman who had been imprisoned but not brought to trial was left to die in jail of cold and poverty. The king's advocate giving no great notice to such informations against witches.
Chambers, in his Edinburgh Journal, before mentioned, dated July 18th, 1840, goes into a wee bit about the tortures that were used to elicit confessions from witches. In her confession, Mrs. Sampson implicated one Dr. Fian, otherwise called John Cunningham, master of the school at Saltpans in Lothian, a man whose story may be noticed at some length as one of the most curious and instructive in the whole annals of Scottish witchcraft. Mrs. Sampson deposed that Dr. Fian was always a prominent person at the witch meetings, and Galus Duncan, the marvellous trump player, confirmed this assertion. Whether made through heedlessness or malice, these averments decided Fian's fate. He was seized, and after being used with the accustomed pain provided for those offences inflicted upon the rest, first by throwing of his head with a rope, whereat he would confess nothing, and secondly being urged by fair means to confess his follies, which had as little effect. Lastly, he was put to the most severe and cruel pain in the world, called the boots, when, after he had received three strokes, being inquired if he would confess his acts and wicked life, his tongue would not serve him to speak, in respect whereof the rest of the witches willed it to search his tongue, under which was found two pins thrust up into the head, whereupon the witches did say, Now is the charm stinted, and showed that those charmed pins were the cause he could not confess anything. Then was he immediately released of the boots, brought before the king, and his confession was taken. Appalled by the cruel tortures he had undergone, Fien seems now only to have thought how he could best get up a story that should bring him to a speedy death. He admitted himself to be the devil's register or clerk, who took the oaths from all witches at their initiation, and avowed his having bewitched various persons. In proof of the latter statement, he instanced the case of a gentleman near Saltpans, whom he had so practised upon. He said that the victim fell into fits at intervals. This person, who seems to have been either a lunatic or afflicted with St. Vitus's dance, was sent for, and, being in His Majesty's chamber, suddenly he gave a great scritch and fell into madness, sometimes bending himself and sometimes capering so directly up that his head did touch the ceiling of the chamber, to the great admiration of His Majesty. On these and other accounts, Dr. Fian was sent to prison, but he contrived soon after to escape from it. By means of a hot and hard pursuit, he was retaken, and brought before the king to be examined anew, but the unfortunate man had had time to think, and, like Cranmer, under somewhat similar circumstances, resolved to retract the admissions which the weakness of the body had drawn from him, and to suffer anything rather than renew them. He boldly told this to the king, and James, whom these records make us regard with equal contempt and indignation, ordered the unfortunate man to be subjected to the following most horrible tortures. His nails upon all his fingers were riven and pulled off with an instrument called in Scottish a turkis, which in England are called a pair of pincers, and under every nail there was thrust in two needles ever, even up to the heads, at all which torments, notwithstanding, the doctor never shrunk a whit, neither would he then confess it the sooner for all the tortures inflicted on him. Then was he, with all convenient speed by commandment, conveyed again to the torment of the boots, wherein he continued a long time, and did abide so many blows in them that his legs were crushed and beaten together as small as might be, whereby they were made unserviceable for ever. Notwithstanding all this, such was the strength of mind of the victim, or, as King James termed it, so deeply had the devil entered into his heart, that he still denied all, and resolutely declared that all he had done and said before was only done and said for fear of the pains which he had endured. As according to this fashion of justice, to confess or not to confess was quite the same thing. The poor schoolmaster of Saltpans was soon afterwards strangled and then burned on the castle hill of Edinburgh. January 1591 The boots were a contraption into which the feet and legs were put, and 
it seemed to be made of iron with gaps in the side. The gaps were there to allow for wooden wedges to be inserted. And what it means by so many strokes within the boots was that literally a guy with a mallet smashed those wedges into the gaps in this uh, metal contraption. Um, Sometimes to the point that the marrow was squished from the, the body of the person who was undergoing that torture. It's certainly one of the worst tortures that, that I've come across in my researches. We'll go back to Francis for his Scottish Review article, where he continues, As soon as the Presbyterian form of worship was restored at the Revolution, there was a faint recrudescence of the persecution. In 1692, a commission was issued for the trial of four women in Dumfries. Three years later, two more were executed in Inverness, and in 1696, a witch who had denounced others led to a sort of general commission being issued in quite the old way. The next year, a commission was granted for the trial of 24 persons at Paisley upon the spiteful accusation of a little girl of good family who afterwards confessed her imposture. Of this batch, one hanged himself in prison and five were burnt. The General Assembly, too, woke up and discussed the advisability of presenting an address to the Council asking for severer measures against witches, but it was all of no use. Although the Council might yield to the ministers for a moment, they had no intention of reviving the witch hunts of the Covenanting Decade. In 1699, a witch and a warlock who had been tried in Rossshire got off scot-free, and although nine others were remitted to the commission who had tried them for arbitrary punishment, they were probably only banished. In the years between this and 1705, four more executions follow, and then there comes a pause. We hear no more of trials for witchcraft until 1727, when the last witch who suffered in Scotland was burnt at Dornoch by the sheriff deputy of Sutherlandshire, in spite of a previous warning from the king's advocate against the impropriety of meddling with such cases. The abolition by the Parliament of the United Kingdom in 1735 of the penal laws against witchcraft made any further persecution impossible. The little girl in Paisley that was mentioned there, having given false testimony against witches, is actually explained in Chambers' Edinburgh Journal article here. Scattered cases took place near the beginning of the 18th century, such as those at Paisley in 1697, at Pittenween in 1704, and at Spot about the same time. It is curious that, as something like direct evidence became necessary for condemnation, that evidence presented itself, and in the shape of possessed or enchanted young persons who were brought into court to play off their tricks. The most striking case of this nature was that of Christian Shaw, a girl about eleven years old, and the daughter of Mr. Shaw of Burgarin in Renfrewshire. This wretched girl, who seems to have been an accomplished hypocrite, young as she was, quarrelled with a maidservant, and to be revenged, fell into convulsions, saw spirits, and, in short, feigned herself bewitched. To sustain her story, she accused one person after another, till not less than twenty were implicated, some of them children of the ages of twelve and fourteen. They were tried on the evidence of the girl, and five human beings perished through her malicious impostures. It is remarkable that this very girl afterwards founded the thread manufacture in Renfrewshire. From a friend who had been in Holland, she learnt some secrets. In spinning and putting them skilfully in practice, she led the way to the extensive operations carried on in that department of late years. She became the wife of the Minister of Kilmores, and, it is to be hoped, had leisure and grace to repent of the wicked misapplication in her youth of those talents which she undoubtedly possessed. She should have been done for murder. One naturally asks for what crime these thousands of human beings were put to death. In the first place, it is impossible that a net so widely cast should not have caught within its meshes some real criminals. Such was Erskine of Dunn, who was beheaded with his three sisters in 1613 for poisoning with herbs obtained from a reputed witch, two young nephews who stood between him and a rich succession, 
Others, again, were lunatics, like the Major Weir, familiar to the readers of Red Gauntlet. This wretch, who had all his life been noted for his piety, was hanged at Edinburgh in 1670 on his voluntary confession of crimes which, though horrible and revolting, certainly required no supernatural aid for their accomplishment. And we're going to get into Major Weir because he was an interesting character all on his own. So this information comes from James Grant's Old and New Edinburgh, which is an 1880 publication, a chapter entitled The West Bow, chapter 38 of volume 1. Major Weir, after a life characterised externally by all the graces of devotion, but polluted in secret by crimes of the most revolting nature, in which little needed the addition of wizardry to excite the horror of living men, fell into a severe sickness, which affected his mind so much that he made open and voluntary confession of all his wickedness. According to Professor Sinclair, the Major had made a compact with the devil, who of course outwitted his victim. The fiend had promised, it was said, to keep him scathless from all peril, but a single burn, hence the accidental naming of a man named Burn by the sentinels at the nether Beauport, when he visited them as a commander of the guard, cast him into a fit of terror, and on another occasion... Finding Liberton burn before him was sufficient to make him turn back trembling. His sickbed confession, when he was now verging in his seventieth year, seemed at first so incredible that Sir Andrew Ramsay of Abbotshall, who was Lord Provost from 1662 to 1673, refused for a time to order his arrest. Eventually, however, the Major his sister, the partner of at least one of his crimes, and the black magical staff were all taken into custody and lodged in the toll booth. The staff was secured by the express request of his sister, and local superstition still records how it was wont to perform all the major's errands for any article he wanted from the neighbouring shops, that it answered the door when the pin was turled, and preceded him in the capacity of a link boy at night in the lawn market. In his house, several sums of money and dollars were found wrapped up in pieces of cloth. A fragment of the latter, being thrown on the fire by the bailey in charge, went up the white chimney with an explosion like a cannon, while the dollars, when the magistrate took them home, flew about in such a fashion that the demolition of his house seemed imminent. While in prison, he confessed without scruple that he had been guilty of crimes alike possible and impossible. Stung to madness by conscience, the unfortunate wretch seemed to feel some comfort in sharing his misdeeds with the devil, yet he refused to address himself to heaven for pardon. To all who urged him to pray, he answered by wild screams, "'Torment me no more! I am tortured enough already!' was his constant cry, and he declined to see a clergyman of any creed, saying, according to Law's memorials, that his condemnation was sealed, and since he was to go to the devil, he did not wish to anger him. When asked by the minister of Ormiston if he had ever seen the devil, he answered that any feeling he ever had of him was in the dark. He and his sister were tried on the 9th of April 1670 before the Justiciary Court. He was sentenced to be strangled and burnt, the usual punishment for witchcraft in Scotland. Between Edinburgh and Leith and his sister Grizel, called Jean by some, to be hanged in the grass market. When his neck was encircled by the fatal rope at the place of execution and the fire that was to consume his body, the burn, to which, as the people said, the devil had lured him, he was bid to say, Lord, be merciful to me, but he only replied fiercely and mournfully, Let me alone, I will not, I have lived as a beast and must die like a beast. When his lifeless body fell from the stake into the flaming pyre beneath, his favourite stick, which, according to Ravilek Redivivus, was all of one piece of thornwood with a crooked head, and without the aid of which he could perform nothing, was cast in also, and it was remarked by the spectators that it gave extraordinary twistings and writhings, and was as long in burning as the Major himself. The place where he perished was at Greenside, on the sloping bank, whereon in 1846 was erected the new church, so called. If this man was not mad, 
He certainly was a singular paradox in human nature, and one of a kind somewhat uncommon. Outwardly, he exhibited the highest strain of moral sentiment for years, and during all that time, had been secretly addicted to every degrading propensity, till eventually, unable to endure longer the sense of secret guilt and hypocrisy, with the terrors of sickness and age upon him, and death seeming near, he made a confession, which some at first believed, and on that confession alone he was sentenced to die. If Weir was not mad, the ideas and confessions of his sister show that she undoubtedly was. She evidently believed that her brother Stick was one possessed of no ordinary power. Professor Sinclair tells us that on one of the ministers returning to the toll booth from Greenside, she would not believe that her brother had been burned till told that it had perished too, whereupon, notwithstanding her age, she nimbly and in a furious rage fell upon her knees, uttering words horrible to be remembered. She assured her hearers that her mother had been a witch, and that when the mark of a horseshoe, a mark which she herself displayed, came on the forehead of the old woman, she could tell of events then happening at any distance, and to her ravings in the toll booth must some of the darkest traditions of the West Bow be assigned. She confessed that she was a sorceress, and among other incredible things, said that many years before a fiery chariot, unseen by others, came to her brother's house in open day. A stranger invited them to enter, and they proceeded to Dalkeith. While on the road another stranger came, and whispered something in the ear of her brother, who became visibly affected, and this intelligence was tidings of the defeat of the Scottish army that very day at Worcester. She stated, too, that a dweller in Dalkeith had a familiar spirit, who span for her an extraordinary quantity of yarn in the time that it would have taken four women to do so. At the place of execution in the grass market, a frenzy seized her, and the wretched old creature began to rent her garments in order, as she shrieked, that she might die with all the shame she could. Undeterred by her fate, ten other old women were in the same year burned in Edinburgh for alleged dabbling in witchcraft. The Reverend Professor, who compiled Satan's Invisible World, relates that a few nights before the Major made his astounding confession, the wife of a neighbour, when descending from the castle hill towards the bowhead, saw three women in different windows, shouting, laughing and clapping their hands. She passed on, and when abreast of Major Weir's door, she saw a woman of twice mortal stature arise from the street. Filled with great fear, she desired her maid who bore a lantern to hasten on, but the tall spectre still kept ahead of them, uttering shouts of unmeasurable laughter, till they came to the narrow alley called the Stinking Close, into which the spectre turned, and which was seen to be full of flaming torches, as if a multitude of people were there, all laughing merrily. This sight, at so dead a time of night, no people being in the windows belonging to the close, made her and her servant haste home, declaring all they saw to the rest of the family. For upwards of a century after Major Weir's death, he continued to be the bugbear of the bow, and his house remained uninhabited. His apparition, says Chambers, was frequently seen at night, flitting like a black and silent shadow about the street. His house, though known to be deserted by everything human, was sometimes observed at midnight to be full of lights and heard to emit strange sounds as of dancing, howling, and, what is strangest of all, spinning. Some people occasionally saw the Major issue from the low close at midnight, mounted on a black horse without a head, and gallop off in a whirlwind of flame. Nay, Sometimes the whole inhabitants of the bow would be roused from their sleep at an early hour in the morning by the sound of a coach and six, first rattling up the lawn market and then thundering down the bow, stopping at the head of the terrible close for a few minutes and then rattling and thundering back again, being neither more nor less than Satan come in one of his best equipages to take home the Major and his sister after they had spent a night's leave of absence in their terrestrial dwelling. We'll go back to Francis again, who tells us in nearly every instance the supposed witches were old women of the lowest class, whose poverty, sour temper, or singular habits had made them an object of dislike to their neighbours. Of this sort was Janet Wishart, whose deeds seem to have been the moving cause of the Aberdeen Commission of 1596. In her ditty, besides the usual stock accusations of causing sickness and casting cantrips, it was gravely alleged as an offence against the panel that she 
puts on nightly a great fire, holds the same on the whole night, and sits thereat, altogether contrarious to the nature of well-living persons. After this clear evidence of devilish practices, it is not wonderful to learn that Theases found it to be due to her casting certain drugs of witchcraft, such as old Shun, into the fire of her neighbour, John Club, that the said John Club is become altogether depauperate. In fact, the theory very early adopted by the High Court of Justiciary that any injury following upon a threat uttered by a suspected witch was of itself sufficient proof of the possession of satanic power made almost any evidence relevant to infer the pains of law. Thus, in the case of Margaret Hutchinson in 1661, the panel, who had been already indicted and acquitted, was tried a second time before the same assize. The only fresh evidence produced was that, on the occasion of a quarrel with her servant, she had been heard to tell that girl that she should repent it. The servant had a fit the same evening, upon which her mistress assured her that she should not die that time, and transferred the disease to the house cat, who was found dead near the servant's bed. For this malefice, evidenced in true Jack Cade fashion by the testimony of a person who had seen the girl ill and the cat dead, Margaret Hutchinson was found guilty and burnt at the stake. There remain the cases where the accusation of witchcraft was but the result of the panel's perseverance in a course of imposture, thus it was with those who pretended to work miraculous cures. Doubtless many of these had a very fair knowledge of simples, which they had learnt either as a family secret or from those highland women who were accustomed to fill the place of doctors in their rude communities. But they generally mixed their herbs to the sound of mysterious chants, which were either corrupted beyond all intelligibility or had, so to speak, a twang of popery about them. Such were the devilish prayers used by Agnes Sampson, one of the Bothwold witches, One of these alludes to the power of Holy Kirk to forgive sins in a way that must have been very shocking to Puritan feelings, while another speaks out still more plainly. All kinds of ills that ever may be, in Christ's name I conjure ye, I conjure ye both mere and less, by all the virtues of the mess and so on. And in the case of Thomas Grieve, burnt at Edinburgh in 1623, the making of crosses upon the water brought by him from the holy well at Hillside, whereby he effected his cures, is one of the charges in the indictment against him. Yet the judges by no means insisted upon the use of Catholic or superstitious ceremonies as necessary for conviction, for Alison Pearson in 1588 and Barty Patterson in 1607 were both of them burnt for charms, which any Protestant might have repeated. In fact, the curing of the sick by any means was always one of the most fatal accusations that could be brought against a witch, a fact which is perhaps explained by the remark of the editor of the Spottiswood Miscellany that the first informations against witches were often laid by chirurgeons or surgeons. One has less sympathy with those who practice on their neighbours' fear of unknown for the sake of obtaining respect or money. Thus, Isabel Grierson, burnt in 1607, is said to have bewitched Robert Pedden until he remembered that he owed her nine shillings fourpence, on paying which he was cured. And Agnes Finney, burnt in 1644, although in the minds of her judges, guilty of scattering disease and misfortune right and left, seems to have been always ready to take them off again, on being properly entreated with a little hospitality. No doubt, many of these old dames, like other charlatans, came at last really to believe in their own power to inflict injuries. I have been a very drunkensome woman, said Helen Guthrie in 1661, in an apparently genuine confession, a terrible banner and cursor, and when I gave my malice into any person or creature, it usually lighted. If ceremonial magic was ever used in Scotland, it was among the nobles and ladies of the court, and certainly never was put in evidence in any witch trial, for the spells used by the witches of Fife and Lothian were, like the all sorts of thrums and threads cut of all colours with a piece of crooked wire like a fish hook, the possession of which was enough to condemn Janet Lucas in 1597, merely the fetishes to which barbarous people in all ages seemed to have attached faith. 
the infliction of disease by the ill treatment of a figure or picture of clay or wax made in the likeness of the person to be bewitched is almost the only practice of Scottish witchcraft which can be traced to classical times. Which is kind of strange since that in particular is associated very much with voodoo, uh, the, the voodoo dolls that you stick pins and things in. So it's interesting to see that that was a, a mainstay of Scottish witchcraft for a long time. Francis goes on to tell us uh, about witch trials themselves and what you could expect by way of fairness uh, if accused. The public trial followed upon the conclusion of the prisoner's examination, and here at least one would think that the poor, hunted, harassed, tortured creature would have been treated with some show of fairness. But it was not so. When the indictment had once been read and the assize sworn, pains seemed to have been taken by everyone to prevent the panel having a chance for her life. The indictment, of course, set out the malefices or acts of witchcraft of which the panel was accused. We have already seen some instances of the inherent absurdity of most of these charges, but it is shocking to find that the advocate for the defence was, in effect, prohibited from saying anything against them. Thus, in the case of Isabel Young, who was tried before the High Court in 1629, the accused was charged with having taken a disease off a patient and with laying it under a barn door so that it seized upon the next comer. It was replied by her advocate that this was an idle fable, taken probable from the like out of Ariosto, and to another charge of laying a disease upon her nephew and that he died thereof, the same advocate answered that he could prove that the nephew was cured by John Purvis, a surgeon, lived eleven years afterwards, and had children. Yet both these defences were repelled as contrary to the indictment. In matters of evidence, things were almost worse, for while witnesses not generally admitted to testify by Scottish law, women, infamous persons, and so shy criminous, as some of the judges ungallantly put it, were allowed to give evidence against a witch, yet she was sometimes refused leave to call witnesses in her own defence, on the ground that she might have obtained all the evidence she wanted by interrogating those for the prosecution. When I add that the assize were often threatened by the king's advocate with a prosecution for willful error, if they acquitted the panel, and that both they and the witnesses were assured, as Sir George Mackenzie tells us, that if a witch escape, they will die for it, it is not surprising that the number of acquittals are only about 1% of the indictments. It reflects infinite credit upon the assizers that there were any acquittals at all. It seems from the first to have been a sort of tacit compact between the nobles and the clergy that the accusation of witchcraft should never be brought against a person of position. To this rule there was no exception, and it is noteworthy that in the very few cases in which persons like the Lion King, Lady Fowlis, Euphemia Macallion, and Erskine of Dunn were brought to trial, the whole process was set on foot by the Privy Council without ecclesiastical instigation. In the time of James VI, most of the women who dealt in charms and spells received the patronage of powerful ladies, who were commonly reported not only to learn their art, but to practice it themselves. This was the case with Barbara Napier and Agnes Sampson, two of the Bodwell witches who were both under the protection of the Countess of Angus, and similar tales are told of the Countess of Huntley, the Countess of Athol, Lady Buccleuch of Branksholm, and many others. Yet, while the lower class of witches are persecuted to the death, their accomplices in the higher ranks were never even threatened. John Knox himself, whom James Melville heard preaching the death sermon of a witch at St Andrews, she being set up at a pillar before him, was in possession of enough evidence against the countesses of Huntley and Athol to have burnt a dozen witches of less rank. Yet it never seems to have entered into his head to bring either of them to trial. The same respect of persons is noticeable in Puritan times, when the wives of certain magistrates of Inverkeething, who had been denounced by a witch executed in 1649, were not allowed to be prosecuted. And in 1678, some witches brought before the High Court, who, if they had been permitted, were ready to file with their delation sundry gentlewomen and others of fashion, 
were forbidden to mention their names. There is much less doubt as to the cause of the cessation of the persecution, when science, that is to say, the pursuit of knowledge based upon ascertained fact, awoke from the sleep into which he had sunk so soon as the triumph of Christianity over paganism was assured, the European began to realise that the phenomena to which he had hitherto attributed a supernatural origin were but the result of natural laws. It was not that science, as a great part of the Scottish clergy then taught, was sapping the foundations on which the belief of the supernatural rested, but that she was every day reducing the area within which the action of the supernatural was, I do not say possible, but necessary. It was clearly impossible for any educated Scottish man to believe that disease could be caused or cured by a witch when Sydenham was working out the true principles upon which the treatment of disease should be based. Nor could he longer believe that a dozen old women assembled in a church could bring on a thunderstorm to sink their neighbour's ships, when Franklin had proved that the lightning was but the discharge of a fluid whose action could be brought under human control. It was then science, rather than rationalism or humanity, which brought about the downfall of the belief in witchcraft, and it is well that it was so, for science never gives back the territory she has gained and although many old superstitions may from time to time be revived among us, we may be quite sure that the belief in witchcraft will not be one of them. There's a report of one of the last witches to be tried in Robert Chambers' Edinburgh Journal. The last justiciary trial for witchcraft in Scotland was in the case of Elspeth Rule, who was convicted in 1708 and banished. The last regular execution for the crime is said to have taken place in Dornoch in 1722, when an old woman was condemned by David Ross, sheriff of Caithness, but we fear the provincial records of the north have inquired into would show later deaths on this score. However, here may be held to end the tragical part of the annals of Scottish witchcraft. The number of its victims, for reasons previously stated, it would be difficult accurately to compute, but the Black Scroll would include, according to those who have most attentively inquired into the subject, upwards of 4,000 persons, and by what a fate they perished, cruelly tortured while living, and dismissed from life by a living death amid the flames. And for what? For an impossible crime. And who were the victims, and who the executioners? The victims, in by far the majority of cases, were the aged, the weak, the deformed, the lame, and the blind, those to whom nature had been ungentle in her outward gifts, or whom years and infirmities had doomed to poverty and wretchedness. Exactly that class of miserable beings, in short, for whom more enlightened times provide houses of refuge and endow charitable institutions aiming in the spirit of true benevolence to supply to them that attention and support which nature or circumstances have denied them the power of procuring for themselves. Often, too, was a victim a person distinguished by particular gifts and endowments, gifts bestowed by the Creator in kindness, but rendered fatal to the possessor by man. These were the victims of witchcraft. The executioners were the wisest and greatest of their time, Men distinguished above their fellows for knowledge and intelligence, ministers of religion and of the laws, kings, princes, and nobles. These, and such as these, judged of the crime, pronounced the doom, and sent the poor victims of delusion to the torture, the stake, and the scaffold. I'll let the Scots Magazine for May of 1816, the article entitled On the Popular Superstitions of Ghosts and Witches Incident to the Border, end us for this episode. We shall close our notices of this infernal superstition with an account of the charm for the baking of a witch cake, whose pernicious virtues and hellish properties are thus described in traditional song and said to have been sung by the Carlines over their unhallowed batch. I don't know the tune that this song went to, so we're going to read it as a poem. The Witch Cake I saw yestreen, I saw yestreen, little whiz you what I saw yestreen, the black cat puked out the grey cat's een, at the hip with the hemlock now yestreen, where her tail her teeth she wummled round, where her tail her teeth she wummled round, 
till twa starns shot frae the lift aboon, and she hawked them ere they wan to the green. She turned them run e her mouth then chowed, till the slaver fell in her great een loud, then drabbled them o'er wi a black nut's blood, and bit a bannock and cad it good. She heard it wheel wi a blink o' the moon, and drapped it wi the rhyme aboon, saying widdershin's thrice she whirled it run, a feast for the bonniest lass o' the town. Gor place a bit to the bride's left sleeve, and a bit mid the bridal blanket's leave. They may suck the ale frae the bizzing horn. It's a warrant they'll skirl ere it be morn. Gor place a bit at yon cradle head. The bairn will gasp with the smeek it bread, and though its mither should rock till day, the wretch shall screech its one away. Such are a few of the more prominent features of this one's dreadful superstition, but which have in a great measure faded before the omnipotent agency of reason and truth. The most formidable which we have to encounter in these days is the grisly fiend poverty, and the piercing charms of a pair of lovely eyes and rosy lips have more power over the young swains of the villages than all the midnight spells and incantations of old mother Shipton and her three thousand cats. Speaking of cats, there's a side note that I'd like to insert here at the end, uh, that it seems conclusive now that the destruction of cats throughout Europe, due to the fear that they were a witch's preferred familiar, led directly to the rise in unchecked rats and vermin, which created some of the worst plagues to run rampant throughout Europe and the UK. So there we go. Uh, it would have been better to leave the witches and their cats alone, eh? So on that note, thank you very much for joining me for another episode and we may see you next time. Take care. <laughs>